I work for a national charity, wildlife conservation charity called Butterfly Conservation. And at Butterfly Conservation, as the name suggests, we are concerned with the conservation of butterflies and also moths across the UK. Um, our work is really quite varied. Um, we run a lot of really major national recording schemes to find out how butterflies and moths are faring. Um, and that will then inform our conservation work, our action that we take to protect those species most at risk. Um, we also give um, advice to land managers, to farmers as to how to manage their land to benefit these beautiful insects. Um, and we own some uh, fantastic nature reserves. And we also do lots and lots of um, engagement of the public. So speaking to lots of people, you may be familiar with a scheme that we run every single year called the Big Butterfly Count, which is our kind of major initiative to kind of get more people interested in and thinking about butterflies and moths. Because unfortunately, um, along with much of, of, of our wildlife here in the UK, you know, they are really suffering huge declines. So three quarters of our butterflies are now in, um, in decline and we have um, a large number of butterflies on the red list and you know species going extinct um, really quite recently so as depressing a picture it is um, there is so much that we can do um, and that is what I'm going to be focusing my talk to you on today. Um, before I get into the nitty gritty, though, I wanted to give you a kind of bit of a background into butterflies and moths um, just to get things um, going. So butterflies are insects. Um, they are in the um, invertebrate um, family, if you're into your classification. Um, I'll just run through some kind of basic anatomy for you to sort of describe the different features of the butterfly and what they do. So we'll start at the head. So this is where, of course, all the sensory organs for the butterfly are found. You can see those um, pair, that pair of antennae there, which the butterfly uses um, to sense its environment. Um, it can use those to find the right kind of food plant for the female butterfly to lay its eggs. Uh, males will use their antennae to detect, to detect a female um, to find a mate. Um, butterfly and moth antennae are quite distinctive. Um, you'll notice that these butterfly antennae are really, really slender with a kind of bulbous bit on the end. Um, moth antennae tend to be really, really quite feathery. And hopefully I'll be able to, I've got a slide where I can show you that a little bit later on. Um, butterflies have compound eyes, so they are really different to our eyes. Our eyes um, have a single lens. Um, the butterfly eye is made up of lots and lots of different lenses. Um, and that's really crucial because it enables the butterfly to detect movement um, in many, many different areas at once, which is really handy um, when you're trying to avoid um, being predated by a bird, for example. And then, of course, you've got the mouth parts in the head as well. So the mouth parts of the butterfly are designed purely for drinking, for drinking nectar from the flowers that they visit to give them that energy that they need. Um, and it's called a proboscis. And it's basically like a long, um, like a bit like a drinking straw, basically. Um, and it sits curled up um, and tucked away when not in use. And then when the butterfly wants to feed on nectar, it will kind of extend its proboscis and put it into the flower to drink the nectar. All of the feeding uh, happens in the caterpillar stage, <clears throat> which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So then we come down to the thorax in the middle of the butterfly. This is where locomotion happens. So we've got two pairs of wings attached to the thorax, uh, a pair of fore wings and a pair of hind wings. And then we've got the six legs, of course, all insects having six legs. And incidentally, even in the caterpillar stage, which if any of you have ever kind of found or looked at a caterpillar closely, it kind of looks like they have loads and loads of legs. Um, actually, they only have three pairs of legs as a caterpillar. And then towards the rear of the caterpillar, they have several fake pairs of legs, um, which enable the caterpillar to kind of grip and move its long body as it's attached to its food plant. And then finally, the abdomen. This is where the kind of life sustaining processes happen. Um, alongside the abdomen are a row of what we call spiracles, little holes where gaseous exchange takes place to enable the butterfly to breathe effectively. And of course, all their, their organs are stored inside there. So in the UK, we have 59 different types of butterfly. You might spot one or two of those species. At this time of year, um, you might see a small tortoiseshell, for example, bottom left, um, and speckled wood middle in the top row there um, on the wing right now. 
Um, other butterflies that we'll see at this time of year include the bright yellow brimstone, which is one of my favourites, um, and the orange tip butterfly, which, as the name suggests, is a white butterfly with these really uh, vibrant um, orange tips to its wings. So 59 species of butterfly in the UK. But as I mentioned here at Butterfly Conservation, oh, Oh, there's a picture of a brimstone. Um, and you can see, yeah, that's a really great slide actually to show you um, the proboscis. So when the caterpillar set up, uh, when the butterfly settles onto a flower to feed on the nectar, it will extend that proboscis and then drink the nectar to give it that energy that it needs to fly. Um, this is a comma, so they will be on the wing really, really shortly. This is another really common um, butterfly. And here is a really great slide to show you um, what's often the different patterning and coloration on the butterfly's wing. So the top of the butterfly will normally be quite brightly um, patterned and coloured. And then quite often on the underside of the butterfly's wings, it will have this what we call cryptic um, coloration or camouflage. And that's so the butterfly can kind of do two things at once. It has those bright patterns on the top side to attract a mate and then on the underside it has that cryptic coloration to avoid being predated so quite often when we see butterflies settled on flowers and feeding they will have their wings folded up and they will only be showing the kind of underside of their wings to avoid being detected by predators and to enable them to feed um, undisturbed. Um, the comma there is showing how it gets its name you might notice on the right hand picture that little white mark in the shape of a comma. But as I said, yeah, we also um, want to conserve moths at butterfly conservation. And actually, moths are way more diverse than our butterflies in the UK. We have two and a half thousand different types of moth in Britain. And it's quite a common misconception that the butterflies are the beautiful ones. Uh, people tend to like butterflies, uh, whereas moths tend to people tend to um, not be so fond of or think that they are just brown and boring or they can be a bit afraid of them uh, because of course they, they fly at night they are attracted to light um, so they can have that sort of quite frantic flying around um, lights at night that people don't like but they are truly really really stunning insects um, you know they come in all sorts of way more diverse shapes and patterns than our butterflies and actually really beautifully colored as well you would easily mistake a day flying moth for a butterfly not all of them fly at night there are a number of species that you can spot during the day. So if you see something during the day and it's brightly coloured and you're not sure what it is, it could well be one of our day flying moths. I'm just going to whiz you through a couple of my favourites. Um, this is the garden tiger moth, um, which obviously has that fantastic coloration uh, with the red and blue um, underwings there. And this is another of my favourites. This is the buff tip moth. Um, so this one it's doing is its very best impression of a little snapped twig. Um, so this looks just like a silver birch twig. Um, and it will kind of have this really kind of a behavior where it stays very, very still like a little twig. Um, and that's its kind of tactic for avoiding predation. And many, many of our moths um, in particular have really quite incredible camo camouflage as adults and in their caterpillar stage too. Um, so this is the elephant hawk moth, another of my favourites. Um, this family of moths are incredibly fast flying. They are shaped like fighter jets or like hawks, um, which enables them to be really, really um, nimble um, and they can manoeuvre really easily as they fly. So they're really incredible if you spot um, one of those. Um, so the elephant hawk moth, this is its caterpillar that I'm showing you now. You may think, why was that pretty... Um, pink and green moth called an elephant hawk moth well there's your answer as a caterpillar it looks like an elephant's trunk um, which is quite random um, but a lot of the hawk moth caterpillars show some amazing mimicry and camouflage um, this next species I have to say this doesn't occur in the UK but I couldn't resist showing it to you um, we have these uh, species of, of moth caterpillar that will you know, mimic even quite predatory animals like a snake. Um, well, they have these incredible eye spots. I can't, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving or not, but either side of, of, of what looks like a snake's head there. And that is a tactic, uh, a shock tactic for a potential predator. It's not going to be going near that. It's like, maybe I'll leave you alone and go about my business elsewhere. So they really do display these fascinating um, tactics and adaptations uh, for avoiding predation.
So what brings uh, butterflies and moths together? They're actually the same insects. It's just that we tend to like, as humans, putting things in boxes and categorizing them. Um, but they are all come together um, under the term Lepidoptera, which means scaly winged insect. And what I'm showing you now is a really close up um, slide of a butterfly. This is an orange tip uh, of their wings. And if you look, you can see all of these tiny little um, overlapping scales that make up the butterfly's wings, um, the colour and the pattern of the butterfly's wings. Um, and if anyone has ever handled a butterfly, maybe you've caught one to try and release it outside if it came in the house. Um, a lot of people say to me, oh, what is that weird dust or like um, glitter that's left behind in my hand when I've handled it? And that is those little scales uh, rubbing off as they come into contact with your hand. Um, and that, again, is, is a bit of a, is a tactic. Over time, the butterfly will lose um, more of those scales and it will become less able to fly. But it can also help them escape from sticky situations. For example, if they fly into um, a spider's web, they will, they will leave some scales behind, but they will be able to escape. So why are butterflies and moths um, important why should we care about them why should we want to attract them and have them in our gardens in our in our school grounds in our countryside in our towns and cities um well first of all pollination so the bees tend to take all the glory for pollination quite rightly uh, but butterflies and moths are also really play a really important role um, in pollination and if you think about moths who fly at night, they are basically doing the night shift. Okay, they're working the night shift. They're out there, they're feeding on flowers, they're moving from flower to flower. They're taking that um, pollen onto their furry bodies and they're spreading it to the next plant to pollinate it. So, you know, the the kind of the diversity of, of the moths enables, enables the pollination of lots and lots of different types of plants and flower and at night too. So they are really, really important in terms of the food chain and the health of the wider environment. So their caterpillars in particular provide food for our favourite songbirds in our gardens. And they also get predated by other invertebrates uh, as caterpillars and as pupa. They all get they all get fed, um, eaten by hedgehogs um, and other and other mammals even. So they really are an important um, aspect of the food chain. So my fun fact, in the UK, blue tits eat an estimated 50 billion moth caterpillars each year. So that just shows you, uh, you know, what an important part they really do play. So as a, a nighttime predator of moths, of course, the bats. Um, and finally, they tell us whether or not our environment is, health, is healthy. You might have heard the term indicator species. Well, butterflies are really a fantastic indicator species. They're very, very sensitive to changes in their environment. Um, they respond very quickly to changes in their environment. So by tracking the numbers of butterflies and moths, we can track the health of the wider environment. And that's why it's so alarming when you see these kind of consistent um, long declines of these species over time. We know that that's telling us the environment isn't healthy. We really do need to do something about this. So the good news is that there is plenty that we can do to help butterflies and moths. And this is what the next kind of um, section of my talk is going to be about. Um, before I kind of go into it, though, I just wanted to run through the life cycle of butterflies and moths, because that's really crucial when we think about what do we need to provide for them? We need to understand that their needs are different at each stage of their life cycle. So I know that you're going to be really familiar with this, but the butterfly will lay an egg. She'll lay it on the preferred food plant of um, the caterpillar. So that's the, the food that the caterpillar likes to eat, which can vary from species to species. So that caterpillar then emerges. Its job is 100% all about eating and growing. So I mentioned the mouth parts of the butterfly as an adult are like a tube for drinking nectar, or the mouth parts of the caterpillar are strong jaws designed to munch through plants and grasses. They are literally eating machines. Um, so they need plenty of food to eat. Um, then they do their amazing thing where they form a chrysalis or a pupa, depending on um, where it is. We tend to refer to chrysalis as one that hangs above ground and a pupa that is buried in the leaf litter or under the soil, which a lot of our moths do. Um, so they need to be undisturbed. OK, they need somewhere to shelter, somewhere to hide, somewhere they can do the amazing process of metamorphosis undisturbed. And then, of course, they will emerge as the adult moth or butterfly and as I mentioned that is when they need the nectar um, to feed on. So have that in your heads as we go through 
um, the requirements um, for butterflies and moths in a habitat such as your school ground or any kind of community green space or your garden at home, even if it's um, a, a small garden or a balcony, there is something you can do. Um, so this this kind of concept that I'm going to talk about now is about wild spaces. So at Butterfly Conservation, we have launched a, a really ambitious scheme to transform as many wild spaces as we can across the UK, which is why it's so exciting to be invited here to speak to you today, because school grounds are potentially wild spaces. So um, tying into the life cycle, then a wild space needs those three things to help them survive and complete their life cycle. The butterfly as an adult or the moth um, needs nectar, the caterpillars need fuel, food, and the pupa or the chrysalis stage needs somewhere to shelter. So those three elements, fuel for the adults, food for the caterpillars, shelter for the chrysalis or pupa are the three kind of ingredients that you need to have available in the environment for these insects to thrive. So let's start with the butterfly fuel. Okay, this is flowers. So you need to fill your space with nectar rich garden plants, herbs, wildflowers, trees and shrubs. So thinking in the context of a school ground, there could be lots of different places within that environment where you can introduce flowering plants. OK, so you might have some um, raised beds or some flower beds outside the reception area. You might have some big tubs with planters wherever you can think of, of finding space to put something that flowers will not only obviously look really attractive and make your your area um, a nice place to be but it's going to provide that all important nectar um, for butterflies and moths um, this top right is marjoram so herb gardens think you know, the gardening areas where if you might have a polytunnel and some gardening areas herbs are fantastic if you leave them and let them flower they will provide really, really rich um, nectar source for butterflies. Um, also flowering trees, of course, so if you've got any fruit trees, it's fantastic. Um, the blossom provides that early nectar source. So you might have heard that some flowers are better at providing nectar than others. Uh, on the Butterfly Conservation website, we have lists that you can download that will list the kind of top nectar providing plants that you can really easily get from garden centres. Um, the things to look out for are the bee symbol um, or the R RHS logos that let you know that these are great for pollinators. So a lot of schools um, get in touch with us about this idea of creating a wild flower meadow. And yeah, we're totally up for that. Uh, of course, a feature of schools is that you will have typically playing pitches, your sports fields, um, but you'll also have patches of grass that are kind of, they're just there. Uh, like in the in maybe in the car park or areas like that, you might have these small areas of grass that you don't need those for recreation or for sport. Um, and they're kind of just high maintenance because you need to mow them a lot. Well, actually, those can be oh, really good. Oh, hang on. Hello. Really good options um, for an area of wildflower meadow. But I would say um, look into it before you start. It's not quite as easy as you might think. It's not a case of simply scattering seed into established grass. You might have some um, steps to do first, such as removing the topsoil or inverting the topsoil um, so that your wildflowers don't have to compete with the grass because grass is grows really quickly and easily. That's why it's used for lawns and it will quickly overtake and swamp out um, your wildflowers. So it can be a bit disheartening um, if you kind of jump straight into a project like that without kind of looking into it and thinking carefully about how you're going to to reduce that competition from the grass, lower the level of nutrients to enable a wildflower area to establish. But even if you just allow some areas of grass um, and not mow them, you might have heard of a campaign called No Mow May, um, which is by another organisation called Plant Life. And that is all about not mowing the grass so frequently and allowing um, daisies and dandelions and other very common wildflowers to grow up and, and, and provide that early nectar source um, for butterflies and moths. So it really can be as simple as that and just relaxing that, that rowing, um, mowing regime. So here you can see um, a um, butterfly happily nectaring on this dandelion that has been allowed to grow up without being kind of mowed down really, really frequently. 
Um, when you're thinking about provision of nectar, it's a great idea to think about the full season from spring through to the autumn. So looking around your garden or your school grounds, there should be something, there should be colour, something in flower all the way through the season to allow butterflies and moths to have that provision of nectar all the time that they're out and on the wing. So early spring sources of nectar, such as the blossom and the wildflowers in the lawn, making sure that you've got something all the way through um, to the end of the season, such as these asters here um, into, the, into August and into September. And again, you can find those lists of plants on the Butterfly Conservation website to help you select different plants that will keep that source of nectar going for them, because they really do need to be sustained throughout their whole life cycle. Um, and finally, on the fuel, um, plants that are well watered will be full of nectar. OK, and this can be an issue, um, especially as we, you know, with the issue, the issue of climate change and much drier summers and kind of more extreme weather events. So think about how you're going to conserve water uh, within your school grounds. Have you got water butts set up? Is there any other ways you can think of? to make sure that we're using every drop of water to its best effect, we're not wasting any. And also think about what happens during the summer holidays. Is there going to be anyone kind of keeping an eye on any newly planted shrubs or plants that is going to enable them to establish through the summer when they're kind of out of sight, out of mind when everyone is on their holidays? So just thinking about that maintenance and making sure um, that you've got plans to keep your plants well watered. So on now to caterpillar food. So we've got something that's going to feed the adults and keep them going, but is absolutely essential um, in any good habitat for butterflies and moths that there is something for their caterpillars to feed on. So butterflies and moths in the UK will lay their eggs on some quite common garden plants. So the majority of the time they like to lay them on wildflowers and grasses, but quite often they will also feed on the kind of plants that you would buy in the garden centre. So here we've got an elephant hawk moth caterpillar munching on some fuchsias. And down here we've got some on the bottom right, we've got some large white caterpillars feeding on some nasturtiums. Um, so quite often caterpillars aren't very popular with gardeners because they munch through their plants. But we would say, look, you can't have the butterflies unless you've got the caterpillars too. So it's all about give and take, allowing your space to be for you and for nature too. There is space for everyone um, and if you can have some kind of sacrificial plants in there that's all um, good stuff and um, over here on the bottom left this is a very common plant that crops up in gardens and all over the place these are nettles and nettles are actually a fantastic food plant for a number of different um, UK butterfly species here we've got a whole load of peacock butterfly caterpillars that have just hatched out and they are happily um, decimating those nettles there so you know if you've got areas of longer grass and kind of nettles um, in, a, in a, particularly if they're in a sunny position, um, it's great if they can be left just to do their thing because they really do. That is an easy way of providing food for caterpillars. Um, but wildflowers and grasses, as I said, if you can promote a wildflower area within your school grounds or even if you're just leaving areas of grass, as I said, to grow a bit longer, that was great news for the caterpillars because they will feed on grasses and all of those kind of native wildflowers that will crop up in those longer areas. So we've got clovers there, um, some bed straw I can see. Those are all of the things that caterpillars love to feed on. So the more diversity of plants you have, the more um, diversity of butterflies and moths you will attract. And finally, trees. Trees are brilliant as food plants for caterpillars. And if you can squeeze another tree or two into your space, um, then that is great news. The list here on the left, rowan, crab, apple, cherry, etc. They are kind of double bonus because they will flower and produce uh, nectar in the spring as well. Those ones that I have put in uh, bold, so the birch, the hazel, the oak, the willow, the blackthorn, just one of those trees can sustain a hundred different types of moth. OK, so these are really popular food plants for a lot of moths. So if you have got space for an extra tree or two and you want the most kind of bang for the buck, the most kind of impact, do consider um, planting one of those native species there because they are the ones that will really attract that diversity. So here on the right, we've got these uh, buff tip caterpillars. They are the caterpillars of that really amazingly camouflaged one. Uh, chomping away happily on the oak leaves there. 
And again, I can leave all these slides with Claire and you can have a look on our website for some more ideas too. So finally, the final piece in the equation, there was the food for the adults, the food for the caterpillars was the shelter. OK, so this is perhaps I would argue the easiest bit to do, because once you put all your plants in, you've got your nectar rich plants, you've got your cat caterpillar plants. Providing shelter is basically about leaving them alone and letting them do their thing and not being so worried about keeping them really tidy and cutting them back and mowing them because that those overgrown areas, those longer areas of grass and shrubs, and climbers such as ivy, are those are the places where butterflies and moths can hide away and find shelter. And crucially, they can also be the places where they can pupate or form their chrysalis to turn into the adult. So things like hedges, uh, climbers, long areas of grass are all fantastic. And then um, if you are able to leave kind of these areas of leaf litter, so a lot of people at the end of the season will kind of make a flower bed look nice and tidy and they'll rake up all of the fallen leaves and then they'll put them in a fire and they'll make a bonfire or whatever. If you can leave areas of just let, let the leaves fall, it is more natural for the soil to be covered. Nature wants things to be covered. Um, it will leave all those kinds of little places for the butterflies and moths to form their pupa on the left here. And if you leave stems uncut, you don't worry about deadheading things at the end of the season you just leave them all the way through the winter they are the perfect places where things can form their chrysalis so here on the right you've got that orange tip chrysalis just tucked away and just think if somebody was to come along and snip those branches back at the end of the summer well that's its chance is gone so it's leaving things throughout the summer do nothing for nature as we say and hopefully everything will emerge and then you can kind of get on with things again in the spring I even found uh, this little chrysalis tucked away in an old flower pot uh, when I was starting to put some seeds in for veg this year. So they really are opportunistic. You know, they will find uh, nooks and crannies on the corners of your pots and your planters um, to do to, to to find shelter. And I think that's actually quite clever because it's got ventilation. It's not going to get wet. <laughs> so it's found itself a nice little um, room for the winter. Um, it's always helpful to think about explaining what you're doing. So if you're doing some activity in your school grounds, it's explaining it to other students or explaining it to the community. Why does this area look untidy or why is this grass not being cut? It can be helpful to kind of tell people what you're doing. Leave a sign there, say this is our area for wildlife. It kind of is in progress or this is why it looks slightly untidy. Um, and it's just a good way to kind of engage people with what you're doing, get people thinking about maybe they could do it too. Um, so to close, really, just think about what the impact would be if every school ground was a wild space. So, you know, across the UK, school grounds have an area of 61,000 hectares. That's equivalent to the size of Birmingham, Cardiff, Belfast and Glasgow put together. So just imagine if every single one of them did a few things, made some small changes to benefit biodiversity, butterflies and moths and other um, invertebrates within their school grounds, the impact would be huge. So I really do think it's something um, to be excited about and positive about. And finally, if you do go back to your schools and you decide to implement any of these um, changes or um, start to kind of uh, create wild spaces in your school grounds, then please do tell us about them. You can pop on to the Butterfly Conservation website to register or pledge your wild space that means that we can keep in contact with you and we can send you lots of information as to how to kind of improve or maintain your wild space and even how to start recording the butterflies and the moths that you might see there <laughs>